So welcome everybody. Um, I, I see a lot of new uh, names in the um, participant panel and so that's very exciting. My name is Trisha Gordon and I am the facilitator for today's call and I'm Terry Golightly. I'm going to mute your microphone because uh, I'm getting some, some typing feedback. Um, and I'm, I'm at the University of Virginia, one of the facilitators, along with Matt Burgess, who's also on the call, and Neil Caden, who is in Japan right now. So I'm sure he's having a wonderful time there. We have a great agenda today. We're going to have our lessons showcase um, shortly. But first, uh, let's touch on a couple of announcements. Louisa, do you want to um, give a brief announcement about the Atlas? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Trish. The Atlas Award uh, is opening right now, and actually it will be due in five days. I have seen a lot of people downloading the applications, so I encourage everybody to submit the application as soon as possible. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. And we are also received several uh, 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 emails with, uh, answering our request to be peer reviewers. So thank you so much, community. You answered our call. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Louisa. So Atlas proposals due in five days. And if anybody wants to participate as a peer, as a reviewer of the um, submissions, contact Louisa. Do you want to put your email in the chat there, Louisa, for folks? Uh, yes, I will. Thank you. Yeah. And then I uh, just wanted to remind folks that registration is now open for the Open Aperio Conference, which is in June. Uh, so there's a link on Etherpad, but let me also paste that into the chat for you. So you can go check that out and see the dates and all the details. Um, that would be great. And I also wanted to remind folks, uh, Neil sent out an email recently about lightning talks. That's where any of us who have new things that they're working on or want to work on can sort of give a quick five minute overview of, of that topic um, to the community. And there's an email address if you want to participate. Um, it is farm at aperio.org. So let me paste that also into the chat to sign up. So that is scheduled for April 27th, which is a Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so look for Neil's email or um, just send a message to that address, farm at aperio.org, if you would like to sign up. So Lucy reports that there's no answer from Fawei, so we'll see uh, if he can. Um, oh, you're going to try to track him down through an office mate. That's great. Thanks. Oh, Fawei's here? Already been there. Okay. Hi. Awesome. Okay, nice. Fawei, great. Well, uh, we're going to start uh, the lesson showcase with Dave is going to go first, then Louisa, and then Fawei. Uh, if that's okay, we'll go in that order. So I've given Dave presenter rights and he's got his presentation slides uploaded to the um, big blue button. And so I'm it, first before we begin, are there any other announcements that anyone wants to make that we haven't already made? And I will note that um, probably Laura Geckler put this as Notre Dame. Uh, ATLAS stands for Aperio Teaching and Learning Award. Um, thank you, Laura. I assume that's you. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. All right. So, Dave, I think we're ready to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I can hear you great. Great. Um, so I'm going to try and make sure I leave plenty of space and time for Louisa and Fawei to share. 
Um, and what I want to kind of do here is just simply share what we've sort of toyed around with and messed around with. We haven't launched all of this obviously wide, uh, you know, to scale, uh, but it's definitely opened up um, the lessons function inside of Sakai and the recent enhancements have really uh, sort of given us some other things that we can do. Um, and this might also disclose to the wider community, you know, what's possible with um, Sakai uh, beyond, uh, you know, the other sorts of tools that we already have. Um, Johnson University's, uh, we've got several online programs, we've got a PhD program, so um, we're not huge. Um, we're not like uh, some other people from Notre Dame um, uh, or Duke, other places, but we do try and hold our own with what we do. And I'm going to try and share some things that we've tried to do um, and some things that we implement in some of our courses um, through the use of lessons. So um, this is meant to sort of be a show and tell. I think everybody is uh, relatively familiar with the lessons, um, uh, especially in the most recent uh, year, year and a half. It's really been a phenomenal step forward in Sakai, um, not just in terms of organizing content, uh, but in terms of being able to provide some real good um, potential interactive content uh, for students, um, trying to figure out how they go through content, and not just necessarily for online courses, um, also for blended and for hybrid courses. And part of what I'm sort of curious about is some of these questions. And I want you to think about these questions as as, 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 as I present, at least. Um, you know, What is it that you're doing with lessons? Um, when Fawe and, uh, and Louisa and I got together, we sort of looked at each other and sort of like, well, I'm not doing anything spectacular. Um, and we all said that. Um, and the funny thing is, after we started sharing some of the things we were doing that for us seemed like they were just commonplace and not nearly all that stellar, um, we found that some of the things we had to share were actually pretty novel and interesting uh, in terms of how it could apply to uh, teaching and learning. And so I want you to kind of think of some of these questions about, you know, it, how are you using lessons? Maybe you're using them in the same ways. Maybe you are, in fact, using them in novel ways that you think is pretty norm, but maybe the rest of us don't know about them. And so they could help to inform our own teaching and learning at our institutions. So, um, so I'm going to just kind of share some things that we have in at least two of our courses. Uh, one is an online course orientation. This online course orientation is meant to provide students that are not in a fully online program. Uh, so they're not completely uh, off our campus. Um, these are students that might be face-to-face -face students are taking an online course with us for the very first time at the undergraduate level. We have other orientations that are online for our graduate programs and our PhD programs, but this one is going to highlight an orientation um, that we use for our undergraduate students. Let me stop real quick. Does anybody have questions before I go forward? Okay, so I'll go forward. So, one of the things that we do in our orientation, and uh, and we do this in some of our other courses, is we attempt to somebody use the CSS function that's available inside of Lessons. If you don't know what CSS is, it's Castian Style Sheets. Um, and if you ever look in Lessons, the little cog at the top, there's a place where you can actually add a CSS file that's specific to either that lesson file or that lesson page, um, or if you set it as default, um, you can actually use it for all the lesson pages, which can be pretty handy. Now, CSS can be very intimidating, uh, but there are some very easy and low-end uh, ways to get CSS to work with you. Um, in this particular case, we were sort of um, trying to toy around with how does how's it, can we make uh, lessons a little bit more attractive? And we were able to use that CSS function. Here, you can see some shadowing that appears sort of just underneath here, and this almost looks like a card. Now, I'll have to throw uh, this out here to uh, Clear Creek Bible Baptist College who actually forwarded some of this CSS stuff and shared it uh, in the LAMP consortium. And we were able to sort of uh, use some of that and make some changes to the colors. And it really sort of makes the lesson stand out. You can see the line that's here. That line is there specific to the lesson uh, transparent uh, border thing uh, that the, les the lessons enhancement has made available to us. Um, so that also helps the, the content to stand out a little bit. Um, we also did, um, uh, here you can see sort of it a little bit more in context with how it sort of looks on the, uh, the Sakai page. Uh, that's really sort of all that meant, that's all, all that's meant to show. Um, here's uh, something else that we've messed around with. Um, this is not specific to the lessons enhancement, but it is something we decided to sort of mess around with. And I bring it up because uh, Lucy uh, or Louisa thought it was sort of novel. I didn't think it was that novel. Um, 
a lot of us have heard of badges, badge use. There's open badge projects out there. Um, uh, this does not use or leverage any of that. Because this is an orientation course, it's not fully competency-based, but it is meant to take students through a level of content to make sure they're aware. Um, and so by way of requiring a, a, a particular sequence of going through content through lessons in this course, we can sort of make it feel like students are getting awarded badges. Now these badges are really just images that are made off of some um, off-site um, open source uh, icon creator. Um, it's real simple to use. And they're just downloaded in, in really one format. They're downloaded in full color, and then we've just used PowerPoint to actually change them to a grayscale so that as you go through, you actually end up seeing the badges. Now, a lot of times people wonder, and I think uh, Fawe asked this question, how do, how do students get the badges? The badges are just earned by going from one step to the next. Um, and we've used the question feature in lessons to provide sort of this threshold. You can't go forward until you answer the question. I set questions feature inside of Sakai in the lessons area. Um, and it doesn't matter if you get the question right or wrong, you're just forced, required, to answer the question. Um, this is another place where you can require rationale or you can require uh, sub pages. So this sub page function, uh, we've had it in a long time in lessons. But if you're trying to figure out how students can be held accountable for content before being allowed to go forward, there are ways to do it. Most of the time in the past, we would say um, use a test or quiz and they have to you know, take the test and quiz. But you can also do that with sub pages. You can also require that students essentially click a sub page before they're permitted to go on. And if they attempt to go forward, if you've got your sort of thresholds, your requirements set up right, then the lessons area will actually tell them, sorry, but those pages aren't available until you click, or it doesn't say click, until you do these other pages. There are some other items that are inside of lessons that require or can provide thresholds like this. The question feature in lessons can do that. A test or quiz, Samigo, uh, you can set a, uh, a required uh, premise there. And you can also set a score. This is a nice part about Samigo and how it works with lessons. You can set that so that students have to uh, score a particular score. Um, this is essentially helpful if you're having an auto-scored uh, assessment um, before they're allowed to go forward. Now, it is not necessarily always clear for students, how do I retake that assessment once I go from lessons? But I'm sure that's something we can iron later. Uh, by way of directions on a lessons page. You can also use the forum discussion area to require students to post. You can use the sub page. Um, the sub page um, uh, sort of a trigger is just to click. They just have to click on the sub page, unless of course there's other content on the sub page that's also required. Content links uh, can also be required. So these are not simple hypertext links. Um, they are, uh, they are, they are, you, you provide a content link using the add content item in, uh, in Sakai's lessons area. And if it's to an external page outside of Sakai, I think you could even probably provide an internal page. Students have to click on that link and be taken to the page before they're permitted to go forward. Um, we've used this in one case. I'm not sure how, how it works. I think it works off of cookies, but I could be wrong about that. You can also do that with assignments. Uh, student comments can also be set as required. Um, and so can student pages. Let me stop here real quick and see if there's any questions. I see there's some content and some comments come from the uh, the, the chat window. So Dave, so Dave one of the questions. Ooh, I'm getting some feedback. Sorry about that. Uh, are the badges awarded automatically? And others have commented that they didn't think so. But um, can you confirm one way or the other? Yeah, so the badges, when uh, when students go through and actually earn the badges, everything that's in this particular sort of course, now understand this is not a course that we award for credit. So students are required to take it, but they don't get any credit for it, but they have to take it mm -hmm. before they take their first online course with us if they're an undergraduate student. So we want them to cover the content. So the badges here are awarded based on merely going through a required sequence. Um, so, um, uh, the, the last thing in this orientation course is really getting students familiar with the forums. Um, and the forums is something we actually have a facilitator check directly. Uh, other than that, there's content in here that asks them specific questions. Um, and once they've answered the question, um, then they're allowed to go forward. Now, there are actually two assessments in here from testing quizzes 
that students have to get all the questions right. Uh, there's not very many questions. Uh, there's like less than 10 for each of those uh, tests and quizzes, but the students are required to get all those questions right before they're permitted to go forward. So these badges here, really, if you, if you want, this is just a text area inside of Sakai that happens to appear, and this is, this is that's on the very, the, the first page, it says, this is how we'll track your progress. This mm -hmm. stuff here is really just a text area that's the next sub page. Um, before they're permitted to get to this page, there's a question right below on the bottom of this page that they have got to answer. And if they answer incorrectly, then the question feature allows you to provide feedback to students, and we do that. Um, if you get the answer right, then it also provides feedback um, to students. And so essentially then, once they've gone forward, then they're allowed to go to the next page. This is not the uh, badge uh, window that appears right after this one. Um, we award sort of the badges incrementally. In fact, I even have one in the orientation someplace where we, we sort of Play, play off of this idea that, oops, we forgot to award you a badge. And, uh, and we award them uh, a, a badge that we just didn't award them earlier in the process intentionally. So it seems more like it's responsive. Right. I was just wondering, if, actually, if the awarding of the badges happened automatically. But um, it, Wilma's um, commenting that, that you're not actually using something like open badges um, no, no. To, to make that happen, you have to manually go in. And yes. Well, I say manually. The funny thing is, they are sort of auto magic. I don't do anything. Okay. Essentially, if you go through the pages, um, have you ever seen one of those slideshows, um, you know, on CNN or whatever it is, and and they they click, they force you to click through the dumb thing to see the next images or whatever they are. Essentially, mm -hmm. that's what it is. So when students go to the oh, next, I see. Page, I gotcha. These are just images that are in resources. Yep. Yep. Um, and they appear if you make it to that page. Yes, and th this this is just a text area, and it's Great. it's organized exactly the same way every time every time it's there, and so all the sequence is just like that, and so it appears. Um, so this is that idea that we give students feedback about how they're doing as they go through things. Yeah, love it. I'm not sure if it's really working great. I love the idea of trying to use Credly, but we just weren't able to kind of get there fast enough. Um, mm -hmm. so, but I'd love to hear more on Credly because um, I know that's out there too. Um, let me just cover one more thing here. Um, something else we've tried to use in lessons is third-party learning objects. This sounds really weird, but it's essentially this was something we came across recently. It's called H5P, and some of you may have heard of this. It's sort of the same level or same area as Xerti. Um, it presents the content and feedback uh, in, in a different way. In this particular case, this is a YouTube video. That's the orientation YouTube video that we provide in our orientation. And as you see the little pink dots that are down here, pink and blue dots, those are actually things that show up on the, on the video that, that we've used H5P to put together. Um, and it stops and asks the student a question, and the student has to respond to the question before they're permitted to go through with the rest of the video. H5P even has a way to disable students from being able to skip forward in the video. Now, this is all fine and good, but students might be, you, you might think, well, that's fine, but how does that work with lessons? Well, essentially what we do is we actually leverage this so that at the bottom, right below this area inside of the lesson, students are asked a question that whose answer is only available at the lower end or at the back end of the video, the, the last part. And so students, in a sense, they can't skip forward. They, they have to answer questions. We're trying to provide some interaction there. Um, and then the question feature shows up right below here um, to enforce you know, what it is we're trying to do um, here. If you want to check out this particular H5P object, you can go to this website to see it. It's open. Uh, the one thing that we don't like about H5P quite yet is there's not a real great way to provide that feedback right back into Gradebook or Stats or anywhere else like that. Um, and then other things I just want to cover real quickly. I'm almost done. Um, use of the checklist feature uh, has been amazing. It's been really great. Um, there's a checklist feature here. We actually have it. We provide it sometimes at the bottom of a lesson. Sometimes you can provide it other places. Um, here you can see it's at the bottom of a lesson. Um, and we provided the checklist in this particular course um, in a collapsed and separate section. So here you can see the self-check. That's what we called it. Um, you could call it anything. When you click on the self-check area, it expands. And we simply have a text area that says, double check, did you? And this asks the same sort of item, task in the unit. It's for an online course. Um, did you do these? And if students did them, 
then you would get the chance as an instructor to see, okay, so here are the items that you wanted them to check to see if they did. Here are students that have gone through and said, yes, I did, I did, I did those things. And so you get a whole table of which students have said they have finished which items. Now, this is not the only way to see progress. You could use stats and other things, but the checklist item area has been sort of a neat thing. And with that, I think I'm pretty much done. Oh, um, I'll just mention this. We've been playing around with some modal stuff. Um, I don't think it's really something I can kind of display yet. Um, and uh, so I'll just, I'll, ha I'll hand stuff over to, who wants it next? Is it uh, Louisa that wants it or? Uh... Yeah, I'm gonna make Louisa the presenter now. Great, okay. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. It was super. Uh, are there any other questions for Dave before we move forward? We've had a lot of conversation going on in the chat around the badges and using Credly. Um, people are hoping that Wilma will um, give us another demo, so maybe we can actually schedule one, Wilma, um, for an upcoming session if you're available and willing to do that. Uh, the H5P thing looks really cool, too. So. Um, Thank you so much. This was great. I love the way you guys are using all of these features. So, Lisa, are you ready to go? Uh, yes. Let me see if I can share my screen. Um, I don't have a very uh, tidy PowerPoint, so I have to show my desktop here. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me just see if the Java launches. Um, how is my voice? Because I'm home today, so it doesn't sound good. Uh, let's see. Terry says, can you use a headset? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? But we can hear you for sure. All right. All right. So I shared my desktop. Yep. We can see it now. All right. Okay. Uh, apologize. My voice may be a little bit bouncing because I'm in my home. Uh, we're still snowed in today, and uh, I'm just doing it uh, in my kitchen. <laughs> uh, it's uh, pretty airy. Okay, so um, I first want to show you uh, one of our demo pages. I want to focus on um, the different techniques we have tried and used uh, in the demo side and also in the uh, in my own courses that uh, try to improve the student engagement. Um, so, for example, in this uh, particular demo page, you can see that we try to use the different column design and section design uh, so that we can attract students' attention. So, for example, this one is the one-third and two-thirds layout. So, you have a beautiful picture and draw student attention to this introduction page. Uh, then below, you can also have a uh, full column design here, uh, laid out to uh, indicate those subpages a student can go to, right? And also, um, we also use this quick poll. Basically, it's the quick question feature in lessons. Uh, if you have this type of question set up front, the student can uh, take this uh, poll very quickly and have some kind of uh, uh, quick feedback because you can see the show the poll sign here. All right. And then uh, as an instructor, you can definitely set this up as a required item so that you can actually give a grade. Uh, so for example, this one definitely is just an experiment and for demo purposes. Uh, you can uh, set up specific questions uh, for the course. For example, uh, one technique I usually use to uh, in a course is to give a student a syllabus poll. Uh, I would say, have you uh, read the syllabus and do you follow the syllabus uh, uh, religiously, things like that. So student click yes, it is a, it's an agreement between you and the students. You know, you're going to follow that in the entire class. All right, uh, so this is the demo site. So let me go to the other one. Uh, this is a faculty training site we set up for 
the orientation of Iver, and we also want to throw in how you use um, uh, digital learning space for teaching and learning. So it's not just the orientation of the technical Iver, uh, which is Sakai and Maris. And uh, it's more about how you integrate everything for teaching and learning. So in here, you can see that we only use the one lessons page, okay? And we change the title to start here. Uh, it's very, um, very much an online self-paced course. So we try to set up everything so that the faculty or any user can move forward without too much um, uh, consultation with the uh, uh, instructional designers or the actual uh, trainer for this course. So you can see that we use the multi-section layout so the faculty can go in and move forward very smoothly so they can go to each and every one very quickly. And we uh, modify the Sakai image using the Pauting website, we subscribe to the premium account so we can have those little artworks. Um, so very fancy. Uh, so when you're moving on, as Dave just said, we uh, use all kinds of uh, uh, conditional release. You can see that when you have done those, you have this little check mark here, right? Um, so I think this is a, probably something we missed. When we had a discussion the other day uh, with David and Fa Wei, we're saying that, oh, uh, we tell people where to move, but have we ever tell them uh, what this check mark means? Uh, so for example, if they haven't done anything, it would be a little as terrible here. So let me see if this one has, okay. So if you want to require this item, Update. Okay, so uh, or the diet. Okay, so if you haven't dined before, so you, it, this would be a star, a little star here. Uh, if you finish it, it will be a check mark. So probably it's pretty easy to figure out. So we just take for granted we don't have to uh, tell students uh, or tell the users what it means. Uh, we did find that. Um, some people don't know how to use the breadcrumb navigation, so we have a little bit, little bit um, tip here. You know, where do you go? How you navigate here? Um, but for conditional release, uh, do we need to give them a specific guide? So that's a question that came up. Uh, so when a student goes through this page, you know, go to one, three, four, things like that. Uh, oh, here is the start. Okay, so finally we have that. So they can click next, then they can also go back to the previous uh, overall page. So if you click next, you go back here, and this is how we specifically set up. So they go back to the navigation page and they go to the start to, right, this way. So uh, this is the page we specifically set up so that uh, uh, they can uh, just uh, browse and uh, use the pages all by themselves. All right. Uh, so the other example I want to show you is the um, uh, where did it go? Oh, I have to go back here. Uh, is the core site I use for myself. Okay. Uh, so on this page, I think I need to go to this one. Okay. On this page, uh, you can see that this is my own course. It's a pretty long course. By the end of it, I ask the students to do a final project. So here, I want the students to collect all their materials and post uh, in the lessons page. So I take advantage of the student pages. So the students, uh, as they are broken down into eight teams, uh, each one get a page. You can see here. You can see here. Uh, each one get a page, and then that team, for example, team one, can edit this page. But the other teams, everybody in the class, can view this page. Uh, it's if you recall, it's kind of similar to the um, the the, the uh, forum settings. 
So if you go in and you can see the uh, materials for this team. Uh, of course, this is the first time I tried it. I didn't give students very specific um, instructions on the layout, you know, how you make it pretty. So they basically just go in there and put everything vertically like this. Uh, it just reminds me of the, um, like the early training days with the faculty, you know, they just basically just dump everything in there vertically, just everything from top to bottom. Very similar. Um, so one thing we discussed is that if you want to set this up for uh, student participation, you know, one group is the editor of this whole page, but the others can view it. It's a little bit hard. So if you click the edit button here, and you can see that um, if you scroll down, you can see student page will be associated with groups rather than individuals. Okay, so this is what I already figured out. That's why you can see that team one is checked. But if you scroll down, you can see the other one. Edit the groups for which the item should be shown. So it can be a little bit confusing, which is which. All right, so basically this one associated with, uh, the, this means that who is the owner of this page, who can edit this page, all right? So this is the one. And then this one, edit the groups, this is a view, who can view the page. Uh, I hope that we could do something to clarify this terminology and the layout of this permission level. Uh, so I think the permission settings for the forms are much, much better than this. So maybe we can learn something from the form settings. All right, now going into the function of the student page. Now, if one team can edit, all right, um, everybody in this team can edit, but it's a little bit confusing at times. Uh, to understand who did what. Uh, of course, it, it can be considered a group uh, contribution. So everybody can go in there uh, and do something or they reach agreement, one of the member of the team will update everything on the lesson page so it won't be chaotic. Um, we have a faculty who try to use Wiki for the collaborative activities in the class. But then it matters that we are deprecating Wiki tool, so we ask the faculty, what do you want to do? Um, so the faculty simply try to use Wiki uh, to collect students' findings, you know, the links that they find. So we think, okay, so maybe lessons, student pages can work for you. So the faculty move on to uh, lessons, student pages. So. Uh, he just basically created a student page for the whole class. So everybody click add a content, add a link, and that satisfied his needs. However, the other group, they want to do more than that, you know, collective writing as such. And then he need, or she needs to track who did what, and also um, what time. So the student page doesn't really work. So he, uh, she has to move on to Google Docs because it needs to do the tracking and also the history. Uh, so that's a big problem or not big problem, uh, a feature that student pages lack at the moment, right? Um, so the, uh, and also the other thing is that if you set up a student page, there is a feature for the uh, peer review. So you can see here, if you add a peer review uh, rubric to the student pages, and you can have this type of uh, uh, rubric. So at the moment, it works pretty well. Uh, you know, students can click on those, and then students can have a, a cumulative box uh, counting the total. But it's uh, not the exact the grade point value is the count of the votes. You know, how many fours, how many threes, how many twos. Uh, if the faculty need to use this for the formal grading, uh, faculty need to do a calculation themselves. 
So that's something I hope that um, we possibly can improve, you know, how to move this over to the gridbook. Uh, but from the student engaged point of view, I think it's a pretty good. Uh, you can use this uh, peer review rubric and you can also allow self grade. So uh, if, if in the next round of my class, I possibly do a rubric and tell student you need to follow this so that your final project page will be uh, visually appealing and also meaningful and welcome your audience to look at. You know, that's something I'm considering right now. Okay, so maybe I talk it enough. Uh, let's see if you guys have any questions. Uh, yes. Arisa, we've been having a tremendous conversation going on in the chat. Um, one of the questions that went by early on was if you could show us a um, student view of one of these, just oh, quickly. Sure. Okay, so for we, example, this one I think I can show a student view. Yeah, that looks great. And uh, and so then there were some questions about how does this um, scale to a smaller mobile device? And uh, we've kind of already answered that question. It just stacks the columns on top of each other, uh, going left to right and then down. So um, yeah. I, th I think we've been, oh, there, perfect. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So That's thank good. you for showing that no example. Problem. No problem at all. Yeah, it, it doesn't stack up each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these these examples are making us all just super excited. I didn't even know that <laughs> peer review was in there. Fantastic. <laughs> um, okay. so Oh, I forgot. There's one last thing I want to show you. Okay. It's nothing fancy. <laughs> I think they've already showed you guys before. Uh, okay, so for example, I usually, when I set my lessons, I usually have a uh, what are we doing today section, right? Um, so you can see that basically it's a text box. Uh, you can see one, two, three, four, what we're going to do today. Uh, but then after a few weeks, I try to use the uh, task the checklist, this thing. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's it's basically the same thing, you know, what they were doing today, you finish your assignment, etc. right? So I even put this little um, icon here to draw them attention to the specific sections of today's class. But then I think that this works better than any of the other fancy visual cues. So students mm -hmm. actually take advantage of this. So if you click this icon, you can see some of them being used to pretty frequently. Wow. Yeah, and then if I look at the another one, so this one, for example, you know, you can see mm -hmm. the Yeah, so I, I think that even though uh, you put a list of tasks for the class, but it doesn't actively engage students to do something, you know, even this list, it's a manual list that you need the student to click on it in order to make sure this box is checked. You know, it's not automatic, but it gives something students to do, they get involved. It's a lot better than this uh, uh, menu uh, text list. And also the other question we discussed is that, uh, you, what if we have this checklist automatically generated when the student finish a prerequisite item, then the box is checked. But again, but again, students don't have to do anything. They just finish something, the box is checked. Which one's better? They have to manually check the box to feel their satisfaction, to feel their accomplishment, or the system just do it manually, uh, automatically for them. Which one's better? We don't know. Right, but that's a cool idea. Yeah, that's uh, there's it. So much, there's so much going on in the chat, and I, I know we need to move on to give Huawei time. Um, uh -huh. uh, so if there's anything pressing that anyone wants to ask quickly of Louisa before we move on, please post it in the chat ASAP. But um, there's a lot of good commentary, and I'm sorry it's just going by so quickly I can't quite track it all. 
Yeah, I have to read the comments later. Thank you so much, guys. Okay, thanks a lot, Louise. And if you want to um, stop screen sharing, then we'll I'll switch it over. To yeah, you. send it. Thank you. All right, Fawe, I am giving you presenter. Okay, thank think. you. Yes, I think I'm I just did. Share my screen as well. Can you hear me all right? Uh, you're a little bit faint for me. I'm not sure. Uh, That's better. better like, like, like this is better? That's much better. So how can I share my screen then? Uh, first thing I know. Do you know how to do that? There's a little um, blue, looks like a blue um, uh, monitor screen button at, at the top on the left. Left. Open screen share. You might have to walk through a couple of steps there. And we have about um, 12, 15 minutes. Maybe not quite 15, because that would put, it, put us at the top of the hour. And I saw somebody, while you're getting this set up, Fawe, somebody, I can't remember who now, because it went by so fast. And let me see if I can scroll to find it. But somebody was working on. Uh, a use uses for lessons thing that presentation or something. Who was that? Please, that you were working on for July. Lucy. So Lucy, I was wondering if you might want to um, once that's sort of more fully formed, maybe we could um, take a look at it in an upcoming uh, teaching and learning session and. Um, you know, if you want others to contribute to it, um, just send out an email and let us know where to go. I'm having a little bit of trouble too. Oh, be. gotcha. Oh, and Luis is doing a lesson spot in the conference. Perfect. Bowie, do you need any help? Uh, I'm having a little bit difficult to share my screen. I don't know why. Uh, so there might be a, your browser may be asking you across the top to allow something. Or you might have to click the little, um, I don't know what that icon stands for, but it looks like a battery to me. Um, up in the browser's URL field, you can right click on that and allow things. guys uh, what do you see on your screen right now said, like open at all? screen screen share dot j and lp and ask me to maybe i save the file first Save the file and then run it, Wilma says. Yes, I'm trying. Well, this, this whole topic has got us all so excited. There's so much going on in the chat that I'm sorry is not being captured in the recording. Um, but I'm going to try to save it all somewhere. Really, really good. Maybe I need to go to uh, Chrome before I can share. I mean, I was using Firefox. Uh, I think Chrome is actually problematic with the right, okay. blue button. Why I'm I not 100% sure of that, but. Sorry, it's my, I'm working at home today as well. Because <laughs> uh, it's a laptop. Is there any other way I can share my screen um, instead of installing? Ask me to run something. Yes. Mm. Sorry, Fawei. I... Sorry, it's, it's my fault. I think I should test. <clears throat> you cannot run this uh, screen share something. So I don't think Chrome is going to work. Yeah, I'm, I'm using okay. Firefox at the moment. Okay. 
Um, so if anybody wants to come on the mic and, and talk about some of these questions that are going on in the chat while Fawe is working on, um, or maybe I could just read off some, some of this. <laughs> Jennifer says, I love all these great info sessions on lessons. Wish I could drop everything and work on it all the time. I do too. <laughs> on instructional design that it would it it is very inspiring for sure. Lucy says I did a lesson spoff at the virtual conference but the recording really doesn't capture everything that people contributed. I didn't put enough thought into how it would appear to viewers but would there be scope to edit the video and re-release it as a recording from VC 2016 who should I talk to? So Lucy probably Neil and my guess is he probably doesn't have the cycles to do that, but he might be able to give it to you so that you could edit it if you have the available, you know, software to do that. And Dave says, I'd like to hear how folks are directing students back to a lesson from test or quiz uh, when, when it allows unlimited tries. Is anybody doing that? And how are you doing it? Yes, so they can continue to attempt to do the quiz and get a better score, so right. So Fawe, maybe you can just kind of talk us through some of your ideas. I think we've we've probably seen, um, or I could share my desktop, and you could just tell me what to do to sort of highlight. It's not going to be as good as I'm sure what you would want to show. Oh, Fawe, you're muted, so I can't hear you talking right now. I'm going to unmute Sorry. you. Oops. Send me a link. I can, I can um, share my screen via uh, via uh, uh, online uh, website or whatever it's called. I'm having problem to um, store. I think probably Java or something on my machine. Okay, so maybe. I'm not. I didn't catch everything you said because your mic was muted. Um, I mean, is there any other way uh, my screen can be shared uh, using anyone? No. Uh, uh y yes, I think so. Um, let me get a Blackboard Collaborate session going, and you and you can join it. And um, sorry about that. I. Uh, and then I can share that. Uh, let's see. Oh, I cannot even I'll send see the... you the URL here in just a second. And if anybody else would like to come on the mic while I'm doing this, because I probably can't do two things at once, um, and just sort of mind the um, mind the store. So I'm kind of. This is Dave. I'm kind of curious to hear what everybody else is sort of doing. Um, is anybody doing something you don't see that we're doing? Um, because I really want to sort of raise this sort of surface, this thing about the fact that, I mean, Louisa and I and Huawei really felt like we're just doing normal stuff. No, we're, whatever we're doing is not necessarily unique. Um, and yet the thing of it is, in many cases, I think we are doing things um, that are in some cases unique and that the way to know about them unless somebody else else surfaces them for us. And so hearing from what other people have to say is really what this is about. Um, and so... Um, I'm just really curious to to hear what other normal stuff people are doing. Or maybe another question to ask might be, here's a different question to ask. Does anybody leverage the stats function that um, that analyzes the pages of lessons for how involved or engaged your students are? So in the stats or the statistics area inside of a course, um, statistics will actually now track 
um, the pages that are being visited by the students. So it's not just that you have assignments or forums um, or, or images, for example, being tracked in stats. You also have a particular area in stats that actually tracks lessons, um, which is really, really great because then you can actually sort of pin down and find out which students are actually engaged in which portions of the course uh, based on a lesson count. Has anybody sort of messed with that, looked at that? Um, I've had a couple of professors ask, do you think I could use that as sort of a participation sort of informant for how I grade students participating? And I said, well, I don't think you can use it categorically or solely, but I think you could look at it as some way of looking to see how engaged students are. Anybody else? Um, Notre Dame, uh, Laura, if that's you, I think it is, as far as I know. It was new to us when, we, when, when they did the upgrade, and I looked at stats one day, and I saw that there was a separate section now that calls out lessons pages um, and allows you to track those. Now, how, how what exactly, it, I mean, there's, there's read, there's add content, and I think there's change content or modify. Um, and so students wouldn't be doing as much of that unless you have student pages or perhaps student comment areas. Um, so it'd be interesting to try and design and build out a course that leverages that strength of stats now to provide that feedback about engagement for students. Uh, let me, uh, Fawe, if you can hear me, I just posted a link in the chat uh, for you to click on to okay, join me. I'm, I'm installing the Okay, link. okay, great. Adam, I saw you just came in. I'm so sorry you missed the session. But I think it's being recorded, so <laughs> that's really it good. It is. <laughs> and we're trying to... Um, trying to get Fawei in so we can have share his screen. Able to share his screen. I understand that the Kai 12, another ad content item area up on the left, should be something maybe, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say this because I'm not a developer and and, and I don't want to put pressure on developers. Um, but one thing that I saw earlier in some of the other threads was that there would be an opportunity to add um, some sort of section to the lessons area that sort of raises or surfaces topics of conversation. So rather than having to um, necessarily use the, the little widget on the home area, you'd be able to see, you know, fluid in a sense, not completely fluid, but you'd be able to see new topics or topics that have been contributed to in the context of a lesson area. Um, and so rather than wondering, you know, you know, what's the activity that's been going on over at the forum, instead of students having to go and click on the forum just to get there, if students are not required to post before seeing the forum content, they'd be able to see that there's activity there in context of the lesson content. Um, so that seems like it might be something that's pretty neat. Um, I also saw something very similar that might actually surface announcement content inside of a lessons page. Um, so these are interesting new developments. that will be interesting to find out how people can leverage and use them. Um, and that's, of course, you know what this session's about. Are we about there, uh, Fawe? I don't think so. And we're actually four minutes I mean, away from the yes, top of yeah, the hour. I'm, so I'm I think still, we might yeah. have to invite you back, Fawe, if that's Sorry about that, guys. I mean, Dave, no we were problem. talking about the uh, you were talking about the new feature, you see, Dave. I was planning to talk about that as well, actually. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, also developed a, a, a few new features in the lesson two. Um, exactly what we're talking about. Um, within the lesson page, you can embed uh, announcements. Uh, you can uh, embed uh, conversations uh, or topic. Um, and also, you can embed a Twitter timeline. Um, and also, um, you know, a lot of people in the past try to um, use the files or folders in resources area. And uh, we also develop a feature that allows people to embed resources folder into a lesson too. So that's one awesome. of the things, one of the three things I was planning to, to, to talk about uh, or show, show today. Uh, you can also embed a synoptic calendar as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. We, we're kind of trying to make the lessons tool do all the things you can do on, uh, like the home tool, the um, overview tool. Yeah. We, we haven't actually done every and single the, thing. And the syllabus. It's really a combination of a lot of, it can be yeah. a combination of a lot of things. So, folks, we're about three minutes from the top of the hour. So, we really, in spite of 
just everyone's wonderful energy around this topic, and we definitely need to come back and do more of this because I, I'm just fascinated with everything folks are doing and all the possibilities. And so I know we'll have a lot more to share, not only at the Open Aperio Conference, but in future um, teaching and learning calls. So thank you, uh, Dave and Louisa and Fawe, too, um, for your presentations today. They've been just wonderful. Sorry for the technical um, problem here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll work it out for another time, okay, Fawe? All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and so um, before we adjourn, I just wanted to touch base on um, the the upcoming schedule. So, Wilma, I was wondering if you would be available on April 5th to do an open badges demo. Oh, wonderful. So I'm going to plug you in for that. That is great. And... Uh, on April 19th, we have Nadine Blanchette from HEC Montreal um, presenting on their Tengen course outliner. So that'll be interesting. And we have the two sessions in May completely open. So if anybody wants to um, present more lesson stuff, maybe Fawe, you'd like to come back in May. Um, for May 3rd or May 17th, um, and anybody else who wants to join in on that again, we could have another. I mean, I just think there's so much energy around this. We could, we could spend more time. I I um, can I can present um anytime before 13th of April or after 17th of May. Okay, so not in May itself. Okay, no, and then on June seventh yeah. we have the open period, so that would be our next regular meeting time. So we're not going to have a an online meeting that date. Um, I could we'll, talk about our the Oxford additions to Sakai twelve at one of those sessions. Oh if you yeah, want. how about Wouldn't May third, about... May seventeenth, or May third? Uh, yeah, either I think. Okay, I'll put you yeah. down for May third for now. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. I'll get the time right this time. <laughs> great. And let me just make a note of this. And what's going on in the chat? Okay, folks are leaving. Sorry, folks. Uh, and we are at the top of the hour. Um, so thanks so much, everybody, and we're going to go ahead and adjourn. We've got our agendas for the next few meetings set up, so I look forward to seeing you guys again on April 5th. Take care.